Well, hi, everyone. My name is Mike Schrage, and I'm president here of GMPI, Good News Productions International. These things look familiar. And there's a special person that made one just for me and this series and what we call Faith Greater Than or Over Fear. And so we are really, really happy to have guests come on. We've had over 40 in the last couple of months since we started this program. And we are just looking at various stories that people are telling us in their journey of faith during this pandemic and beyond. And so I'm gonna take this off because I'm safe, because I'm in my office by myself here. And it may be a little easier for you to understand, but my guest today is Holly Davison Shroggy. Welcome, Holly. Hi. And she is also very close to me in another way. As you notice, my name is Mike Shroggy and her last name is Shroggy. And so she is my special daughter-in-law. And so we're gonna to visit today with Holly about her special role that is very, very important at this time. And that is of education and of schools and the conversations that are surrounding this. So Holly, tell us a little bit about yourself, your education and your current role and posture in this educational strategy of these times. Well, thank you for this opportunity. It's awesome what you're doing. And my name is Holly Shragi and I am an elementary principal in Missouri. I am also a wife, more importantly, and a new mom. Um, I'm currently pursuing my doctorate in educational leadership, and I have a really awesome family, a pretty awesome father-in-law, as he mentioned, and I just am loving life and living life right now. Well, thank you. And we're going to go a lot of this time we talk about family and so forth, and that's really important with you. But this time, as a woman of faith and leader, we're going to really talk about education right now because it's close to many of us as either parents or grandparents of children. And that's your passion or you wouldn't be in what you do. Tell us how it's like in your seat as an educator, as a leader right now in this pandemic? What are the tough spots? And eventually, how are we going to help parents make those great decisions for their kids? So we are preparing for re-entry right now. The district that I'm currently working in is either going virtual or seated. So right now, we are just in the midst of planning for students to return to our campus, which is so exciting. I I miss our students. I'm here for our students. And kind of my thinking around this is, you know, hotline calls are down in the state of Missouri. Domestic abuse calls are up and we need our students back in the building. I, I for a lot of our students in the school that I'm particularly in, they do not have necessarily positive adults in their lives. So that is that is what the teachers, the administrators, everybody in our building serves. So I think that's our main thing right now is just trying to plan for reentry. I don't call it reentry because that sounds so formal. I'm calling it back to school. We are going back to school and things are, may look a little differently. Our adults are wearing masks. Um, we're going to practice some social distancing. Well, we will encourage it if you've ever been in a class with 20 kindergarten students. You know, social distancing is sometimes a little bit different. Um, I had a kindergartner a couple days ago and screening come up to me and hug me and say, oops. And I kind of chuckled. I said, it's OK. I laughed, but that's also just our reality right now is, you know, trying to teach kids to be safe and healthy. And but I want our students back. So I'm excited about that as well. And then on the flip side, we have parents choosing to go virtual and there's lots of angst in that decision and trying to figure out if that is the right decision and how are they going to juggle work? And is am I going to be able to come back in December? Or is it going to be different times in December? So just lots of confusion and anxiety from teachers and staff at this point. So let's talk a bit about the teachers first. What are some of the things for maybe some of us who we're not in the schoolroom, in the classroom, what are the things that, oh my gosh, I never thought of how many little details that as administrators and teachers, you've got to think about mm -hmm. just to offer, hey, come back to school, be seated. So we've really just tried to map out our entire day to figure this out. So uh, the CDC recommendation in the county of the health department and kind of have different recommendations, but I mean, they're wanting us to socially distance as much as possible. So the first thing was how many kids do we have in a classroom? 
six feet is not going to happen at this point just because the number of kids we have in classes. So they are, they try to figure out as much as possible. Can we socially distance? So this kind of looks like maybe how some of us went to school and back in the day, but desks are in rows. They're spread out. We can get about three feet, three and a half feet between each desk. Um, do I think that it's like going to be that kids are sitting in those desks all the time? No. So then we are marking spots in the classroom where they will have time to move. Kids need breaks. I mean, you cannot make a kid sit for the entire day in one seat and expect them to learn. Hand sanitizing. I mean, we've had to think about shared supplies. Is that going to happen or not? Can kids turn in library books? Do they have to go to the book hospital for a while to to be clean, they'll be eating lunch and breakfast in their classrooms. They'll be separated on the playground to some degree. Will they have organized bathroom breaks? Will they have organized outside areas? Will they be able to travel to different classrooms? Because there has to be some sort of tracing in case something would happen. So it's just an immense amount of thinking and teachers are doing a fantastic job. It's I mean, we're getting beat up on the internet a little bit right now because we have concerns about returning, but I, I think people have relatives that are elderly. They have relatives that, you know, may be high risk that we're not thinking about. And yeah, I mean, teachers aren't paid very much. It's, it's not like they're going into this getting like doctor pay or nurse pay. It's just a small salary to come back. But in that regard, they're awesome. I mean, my, my staff is awesome. They're handling it really, really well. And teachers have this special calling. I mean, as a person of faith, it's listed in scripture that if you are able to teach, in some cases, the scriptures say you should be given inside the church a double honor and definitely honor inside of the classroom. And so I want our audience to just hear from a teacher and an administrator's perspective, just all of the different things they've had to think through in the last couple of weeks. And it's going to pivot on a dime within probably the days, right? Sometimes you probably have to have protocols in place. If this happens, then this is going to have to happen. And so as parents, when you drop these kids off and so forth, I'm sure Holly would say it, every teacher say, give us some grace. Give us some, some benefit of the doubt that we're, we're trying to make the best we can to follow our school's protocols, our board of education protocols, our county, the CDC, like you mentioned. So tell us a little bit also now, not only just from the uh, parents and the teachers, but Put, can you put yourself in a kid's place? What are they going to be thinking when they see people with masks and, and, and uh, saying you got to be in this little spot in this little square and I can't run out and play with my buddies? Talk about that as a kid for a moment. Yeah. And I think one point I've made to my staff, like you kind of nailed it. I, you might have re read my newsletter the way you were speaking, but we are asking for grace. Our kind of our mantra is to love well, lead well, lead with grace. And for kids, just because we're social distancing doesn't mean that we are not connecting. Like connection is still so important. So just little things when kids walk in and they see us with a mask on, our staff is going to have pictures with ourselves without masks on a lanyard, just so kids know what our face looks like. Um, we've trained our staff like how to be, I don't know, expressive because kids can't see. I mean, if you go, I mean, probably most people have only seen masks in a medical setting at this point before COVID. Now they're seeing it at school. So trying to just make them feel safe and secure. The distancing part, I mean, it's just kind of their new normal. And it, it does make my heart a little sad, but that doesn't mean I'm going to work as hard as we possibly can to make this just an awesome and loving experience for students because I don't want it to be like, you have to sit in a row all day. You can't talk to people. That's not school. So what can I do to support kids and show connection for them? I think is super important, but I just like my little story with the kindergartner they, they still are kids and that's okay. We'll have grace and remind them, but I don't think there's any expectation. And I've told our staff and our parents this: we're not going to get it perfect. So the first day we might make a mistake and the next day we will pivot and we will do better the next day. But 
there's there's a sense of perfection and that's not realistic at this point so and we have students with all levels of care that they came into the school some have great parents and some are frazzled and have their own dynamics they're they're dealing with so they're not on their a game other kids are just how god made them they're just not as focused even some with physical do you are you going to have to do things like um have masks that have a, a plexi or clear at all for some that may have you know more challenges and, and needs to reading lips and things like that we are and we've provided we've provided shields for every single staff member they do have masks um, we have ordered some with the clear they haven't came in yet so i haven't committed to ordering for an entire staff yet but that's something that we're definitely looking at and just having fun masks that aren't like the typical ones. I probably have about 25 now, probably just as many pairs of shoes. I know. Right. But just trying to make it fun for kids, like a big smiley face on a mask. So you walk in and they feel welcomed and, and loved and encouraged to be in our environment. You know, if I was a parent and, and hearing that advice right there, I'm thinking I might a week before wear a mask around, evening time that has a smiley face and say, you know what, you're going to meet some other great teachers in your class this year. And I bet some of them are going to have the same one that looks just like what I'm wearing tonight before I put you to bed. And Harvard actually put out something recently, just kind of what you described, Mike, about how to encourage kids to wear masks and how to kind of train them up to be comfortable with it. So. Well, I want to brag on you a minute, Holly, and that you've also been involved in designing entire school buildings and design a building dictates learning capacity. And you mentioned you're a PhD candidate. What are some of the passions in addition to uh, the pandemic that you're seeing is just in school in general, education in general is is going. Will some of the pandemic accelerate a move towards some of these new uh, educational paradigms that you're researching and that you help design a building maybe encompass? Does that make sense? It does, yes. Um, I do think this is pushing us to be quick learners for online learning, remote learning. So something that I mean, we are trying to be virtual ready. So in the past, a, a teacher might have been a little reluctant to maybe dive into some of those technological, I guess, methodologies. But now, I mean, there's no choice because we are trying to be virtual ready at any moment. So like, I don't know whether, like Zooming, for instance, probably half of our teachers had not Zoomed before this, this pandemic. But if I guarantee 100% of our staff has now or using a lot of the Google platforms or Seesaw is a big app that we are pushing right now. It's just like an educational one where they can post assignments and get virtual feedback from each other. But we're actually going to do some of that in the classroom now. You probably wouldn't have seen that a year ago this quick, but every single student in the district I am, K on up, is having a device at home the first Wednesday of the school year. So. I mean, just constantly changing. So I definitely think that there are some pros to this. Has it been done a little quicker than maybe we would have done in the past? Absolutely. But yeah, it's been, it's kind of neat to watch people step into places that maybe were not in their comfort zone. And I definitely hope some of this sticks around just because kids learn in all different ways. And there's probably a population of students that do learn remotely well. So knowing that maybe we're, making some change for the good as well. I read about a school or a church and a school district of um, real economic challenges in Phoenix. And one of the things the church was doing there was instead of giving uh, books or lunches or clothing or whatever, you know what they were doing? They were doing, what do we need to do in your home to get you internet ready? And they were, Giving that, whether it was a device, whether it was time, are you seeing that at all where you're having in, in areas where families just don't have that, which we take almost like breathing and like water, the internet, they don't have. And so if you have to pivot or if already they're having to do that, if they're a listener and they're in an audience where being seated is not an option, it's going to be virtual and they're going, I don't have tools for that. What, what are you seeing the school doing or what parents or churches could do or people of faith do? 
Very much so. Internet access is still an equity issue. I mean, probably across the nation. So that's a problem when it comes to remote learning. So that's something as a district and many districts across the nation are trying to figure out. So there's been some federal and state money that have been devoted to hotspots. But just to give you perspective, these hotspots allow for about an hour of day of video. So past that hour, I mean, you're, you don't have anything. They compare it to dial up speed. So from an elementary standpoint, we can only allow about five minutes of day of video to be equitable across all students. So that is a big issue. I mean, I think trying to get people internet access if, this, if schools continue to go virtual, it needs to be a priority because I don't, I don't know how teachers can, I don't know, proficiently introduce concepts without being able to model. It would be very difficult. I mean, there are solutions like you can just use audio files, which take a lot less than what a video file would be, but still that that source of connection is gone. Some kids also come up to the school and sit in the parking lot because they can access our internet through the parking lot, even though the school is closed. Wow, wow. There is so much to think about in the education uh, realm, Holly, and it's, it's, it's never going to go back the same. And for some of it, like you've said, we don't want it to go back the same because there are tools out there to make education better. In the minutes we've got left, what would you tell first to teachers who are listening and then secondly to parents, particularly elementary school kids that are listening? School is going to open very soon in your district. Uh, maybe for them listening, it's already opened or it's going to be next month after Labor Day. What would you say to those two groups? Teachers first, then the parents. I just think for teachers, there's, such, there's not solid plans right now. Being ready to pivot is such a hard thing. So just being strong and courageous is something that is supported by scripture but but as for you be strong and do not give up for your work will be rewarded that's one thing that i'm constantly kind of pushing out to our staff that i know are believers and i think god's promise for welfare not for evil to give you a future and hope is something else like fear is not from god fear is from the devil so cast your anxieties pray about everything we don't we don't want to live in this like center of fear i talk a lot about our circle of influence and i don't know if you're familiar with any of stephen covey's work but there's a circle of concern and there's a circle of influence and the circle of influence is things that you can control in your lives and like social media all the negativity on there the political campaigns all these things that we are constantly immersing ourselves in are sometimes not in our circle of influence, but what is in our circle of influence? The amount of time we spend with God, our faith, the amount of self-care we are doing. So I encourage teachers just to stay inside your circle of influence and have faith because God's promise is not to have fear. It's not to be scared. So that's just my advice for, for teachers. And then on the flip side for parents, there's just this huge concern over what to do. And I don't, I'm, just my thought is God is not waiting to, to see if you make the wrong decision. That That's not the intent. It's he is waiting to see if we trust in, the, in him and the decisions that you make. So are we trusting God in whatever situation you're making? It doesn't matter if you're going virtual. It doesn't matter if you're in person. We just need to trust that things are, are going to be okay. Because his promise is not, you know, horrible, horrible things. It's great things. So just have faith in God and trust. If I was a new teacher, I'd want to work under you. <laughs> Thank you. Good, good coach. Um, any last words you want to share as we kind of finish up here, Holly, to our audience that you'd like to share? Not that they've already had great words, but any parting, parting comment? I just think we just need to have love and grace for each other. Love each other as God loves us. There's so much craziness in the world right, right now with whether it's politics or protests or virtual or COVID. It's just, it's for lack of a better word, a hot mess. And what can we control? We just need to trust in God and have faith. So. Good words from Holly. And I hope that you've been blessed today by having a few of your minutes to listen to a great elementary school educator, wife and mother. And so if this is connected with you, we're thankful. 
share it on your social media channels in ways that would probably help and encourage and bless another parent in your community or in your family lineage or some other parent or in your neighborhood or down the street. And uh, again, we are thankful to have gotten a couple of minutes of your time for this edition of Faith Greater Than Fear. Besides sharing it, you have the option for podcasts. And again, Holly, thank you so much and getting ready for school to give us some of your time. Blessings to your school year. And from all of us to you, have a great day. Thank you again. Bye-bye.